If you were a passenger aboard the ship of Theseus, at what point would you realize that Five Nights at Freddy's had been permanently altered? Five Nights at Freddy's used to be a very different franchise. 2015 was arguably the year of Freddy's, with the first game becoming a mega hit, and the second and third games releasing all within a single year. The general consensus was that Five Nights at Freddy's was the scariest game ever. It reached a mainstream level of interest, with casual audiences and horror enthusiasts calling it terrifying, praising this series for its unique spin on the horror genre. Currently? Well, it's a series of adventure, peril, possession, masterminds, science, kids becoming friends with animatronics, and neon-lit labyrinths of fun and fantasy. Every single party we had was at Chuck E. Cheese. It was this cool two-story one. I was telling Scott oh, about it. You know, really wanted to hit that feel. It's undeniable that the series underwent a metamorphosis. A metamorphosis that the fanbase at large is still struggling to come to terms with. But what changed? How did these changes come about? And most importantly, is the modern era of Five Nights at Freddy's really responsible for killing the franchise? To properly answer this question, we first need to establish what actually changed. Five Nights at Freddy's has always been a horror franchise about animatronic characters coming to life. It's easy to say the series' image went from scary to silly, but that would be an over-exaggeration. This is still a horror franchise, and it's not afraid to let us know that. The subject matter is still murder and possession, and the series was always a bit silly, wasn't it? Humor was always interwoven within the horror. So why only now do we feel like the series has lost its edge? It all really comes down to one word. Presentation. What's the difference between the horrifying sight of skin being ripped off someone's face and the hilarious sight of skin being ripped off someone's face? Presentation. Think of presentation as the lens that everything is filtered through, the manner in which content is displayed. A piece of paper says the man walks hurriedly down the street. Should we laugh at him? Should we feel panicked for him? Is there a genuine threat he's running from? This is determined by presentation. One of the biggest differences between the two eras of Five Nights at Freddy's is the way the series presents its monsters. In the old games, the animatronics were made out to be the monsters we were locked in with. Five Nights at Freddy's 1 is careful to show just enough to keep our minds racing. The classic era of FNAF is defined by animatronics never being fully perceived by the player. They're either too close to the camera, too far away, or in a spot that makes it hard to fully visualize them. You also never see them move. The minimalism found in the classic games left massive holes in the player's understanding. The concept of the uncanny valley relies on the monsters being uncanny, and the way the robots all just feel off helps sell this effect. Security Breach completely changes this. The animatronics now have more human-like proportions. Gone are the sunken-in eyes and bulky exoskeletons, replaced by a set of lifelike athletic cyborgs. The animatronics and Security Breach are no longer monsters, they're just villains. The lack of information in the classic saga is replaced with a complete sense of understanding. We watch Chica give chase, think things through, plot out her options, and we know who she is as a character, filling in the holes in our knowledge that made the original animatronics work so well. She acts human in her movement, and in doing so, the uncanny aspect is completely removed. It doesn't help that Security Breach wants you to love these characters, not fear them. Around every corner, in every room, these characters are glamorized. The player runs past the Roxy balloons, past the Chica posters, past the Freddy and Monty plushies, past the Chica-themed bakery with a mammoth-sized version of her cupcake, past a million more stylizations of their robotic pursuers, and are only then met with a character who's been burned into their mind and completely defanged by the world around them. I doubt Alien Isolation would be nearly as scary if the Nostromo's gift shop sold baby Xenomorph dolls to go with your Xeno Slurpees and I got attacked by a Xenomorph and all I got was this damn chestburster shirts. I'm not biased towards Steel Wool. The movie committed these same sins. By the time Mike had to survive the night against the animatronics, they had already been rendered toothless by showing them play and dance on full display without anything left to the imagination. Take Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Nearly every shot of every character has them looking at you. They know where you are at all times, and you are not safe. Most of the camera angles don't show the full character. Their designs are comprehensible and yet feel wrong. The withered animatronics have specific facial quirks that make them feel disturbing. Chica's jaw is completely separated from the top of her face, leaving her mouth in a gaping wide position. 
Freddy's body feels like it's been carelessly draped on top of his endoskeleton. In every shot, his bottom teeth are hanging open, with his shoulders slumped as he leans forward. Bonnie, obviously, has no face at all. Even Foxy, while not necessarily bearing any severe facial damage, is specifically obscured in unique ways. This shot of him on the camera hides his eyes from you, and the next time you see him is in the distance, his bright eyes staring at you from down the hall. The only way to actually see his face unobscured is when he jumps at you. Compare this to Security Breach's treatment of the same concept, broken animatronics. When you shatter Roxy, her personality and sentience remain intact. She still runs back and forth with a purpose, sobbing uncontrollably at the loss of her beauty. The game arguably makes her less scary by pointing out that now she's weak. Roxy can't see, and she herself makes light of this. Monty and Chica, similarly, are made weaker by their damage, making them feel more like battle-damaged Terminators who we got a win over. It also has to be said that any element of fear that comes with not knowing the status of your pursuers is lost in Security Breach, as this very loud sting plays any time an animatronic sees you. But it's not just the presentation of the characters that's been changed. The presentation of the game world itself underwent a similar transition. Audience viewpoint is very important. The movie Halloween is only so effective on account of the camera's placement, focused on a defenseless teen. That fear would be lost if we followed a well-trained Navy SEAL hunting down Michael. The source of the horror in Five Nights at Freddy's was arguably in its insistence on sticking you in one room. The lack of movement made the player feel completely helpless, with the slowly dwindling resources constantly threatening to take away what little chance of survival you have. When talking about FNAF, it's easy to get swept up in modern sensibilities, however, if you zoomed in and lived within its walls, you'd remember just how scary the series was. Quiet ambience, near total darkness, odd noises that don't sound like anything, allowing them to sound like anything. The buzzing and humming that gets more and more prevalent as you progress through the game, becoming a frenzied circus of noise by the final night. This effect was particularly stressful on a first playthrough, when you don't truly know what you're up against. That fear of the unknown is one of the greatest aspects of Freddy's to new players. The player learns that each threat moves along a series of predictable tracks, but not until after they've felt that primal fear that comes with not understanding their surroundings, or who shares them. Security Breach, on the other hand, still has creepy hallways and dark corners, but the fear factor of any given room is limited to the time it takes to walk through it, every doorway taking you from a brief moment of disturbing silence to some brightly lit attraction. The sheer lack of gameplay options leaves your fear of the unknown at a minimum, as whatever unknown ends up in front of you has to be manageable with walking or a flashlight, leaving little to be afraid of. Take contrasting examples of the unknown. Five Nights at Freddy's 1 tells you to keep an eye on Foxy. It then teaches you how to play with Bonnie and Chica, two characters requiring a slow, patient defense. It's very easy to lose track of Foxy in the process of learning, leading to the infamous moment in so many first playthroughs. The player watching Foxy sprint down the halls, the tactics they were taught leaving them completely vulnerable to this unexpected moment. That single moment amplifies the fear of the unknown for the rest of the playthrough. You don't know, is there something else you need to be keeping track of? Have you forgotten something? Is Foxy out? Security Breach also has surprising unexpected moments. When Vanny appears, a previously unseen threat, you simply have to walk away, treating her like every other threat. When Moondrop shows up, you may feel scared at the unexpected nature of this new opponent. However, the fear dissipates when you locate the stacks of conveniently placed barrels, the method of defeating him no longer a mystery. As far as the gameplay, it wasn't so much a metamorphosis as it was a complete replacement. The original series, in my opinion, is actually widely misunderstood. It wasn't just a horror game, it was an arcade game. It tested reaction times, micromanagement skills, and decision making in quick six minute bursts of gameplay. We're handed a few mechanics and asked to react to numerous situations based on the game's rules. The horror came from the aforementioned rules being withheld from us, and the addition of survival horror mechanics like battery level, adding a moment of doubt to every decision. Over time though, these mechanics were replaced. FNAF began focusing more on, shall I say, big moments than the moment to moment. The highlights of Security Breach are DJ Music Man, The Daycare, The Endoskeleton Underground, and Burn Trap, all good segments that, unfortunately, are surrounded by the lesser spoken about depthless gameplay. While the classic sit and survive formula may get predictable after five nights, the ever increasing difficulty makes up for it, and the game is so short that rarely is there a moment where it bores you. This brings me to the story, 
While I don't feel like diving into the specifics of the plot, it's necessary to understand how the narrative shifted focus over the years. The original story was focused on the decaying bodies of children, rotting inside animatronic suits secreting mucus and blood, a serial killer luring kids away with the image of a character they love, and the perversion of the concept of the happiest day. I'm probably giving it way too much credit, but it can't be understated how dark and gritty the original story felt. Eventually, the focus shifted away from concepts like that. The current story features mature themes like death, kidnapping, and possession, but it's presented in a way that almost cleans it up for a wider audience. Sure, Vanny is disassembled and Burn Trap has gore, but both of these concepts are also present in SpongeBob. Now, I need to clarify. In no way am I one of those fans who desire bloody, gory, mutilated corpses on full display. Notice I'm not complaining about the shift, I'm simply documenting it. Concepts like the bodies being inside the suits were never brought up again. The murdered children possessing animatronics is no longer due to a grand sense of rage and unfinished business, it's due to a quantifiable physical substance. These are the biggest changes that fans complain about most often. Now, it certainly sounds like I've been blaming Security Breach, but... I don't actually blame Security Breach or the Steel Wool era at all, despite what the fanbase might think. Instead, I think it all ties back to the Ship of Theseus. The Ship of Theseus is a thought experiment that asks whether a ship, after having its pieces removed and replaced one by one, is still the same ship. If you replace every individual piece in the Ship of Theseus, is it still the Ship of Theseus? For the full history of the question and proposed solutions, feel free to consult the internet. However, for the purpose of this video, I'd like to ask a different question. If you were a passenger aboard the Ship of Theseus, at what point would you realize the ship you're standing on isn't the same as it once was? When would you realize that you're standing on a different ship? The answer is quite obvious. Maybe you'd start to notice that something feels different as the internal parts are slowly swapped. However, I believe you'd only truly realize once the exterior is replaced. Once it appears different externally to the naked eye, that's when you say, this isn't the Ship of Theseus anymore failing to take into account the fact that internally the ship had been changing this entire time. Only upon noticing the external alterations would you consider the ship different. I call this complete theoretical scenario the Theseus Effect, and it's something that's happening to the Five Nights at Freddy's fanbase. See, all this time I've been comparing the absolute extreme ends of the franchise, the very first game to the most recent ones. It was scary, but now it's more cheery. It didn't have animatronics acting in character, now it does. It's easy to look at the franchise and take up this opinion, blaming Steel Wool in the modern era for the changes in FNAF. But in reality, it isn't Security Breach's fault. At all. See, Security Breach was the moment that externally, FNAF looked different. It played different. It released differently. It wasn't teased on Scott Games piece by piece. It didn't have that classic style. It was a major release that played entirely differently to the other games in the franchise. The series had definitively changed. But, internally, it had been changing for quite some time. This change began around December of 2015, in which The Silver Eyes was released. This book was aimed at young adult audiences, as described by Scholastic themselves, and that led to Sister Location. When you look under the hood, Sister Location is the first time this metamorphosis was really noticeable. William Afton's character was defined, and vague expectations about a twisted serial killer were let down with the reveal of a mad plotting scientist. The grimy walls of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza were replaced with futuristic submarine-like passageways. Circus Baby wasn't a monster. She was a villain. A villain who spoke full sentences and enacted a plan. A plan that required manipulating us, and for the game to explain to us who this character was. Five Nights at Freddy's 6 dialed up the humor, settling on a lighter tone that still continues to this day, and centered the story around two heroic characters planning together and defeating a series of enemies. Ultimate Custom Night leaned into our love of the characters, and Help Wanted removed the barrier between us. Now we were allowed to get up close and personal with Freddy and friends. We were allowed to openly love them, not fear them. Security Breach changed the gameplay and overall visual presentation. But all of these aspects that describe the modern state of Five Nights at Freddy's were in place long before 2021. People just didn't really notice until it was called attention to. Sister Location carried with it fundamental changes to the franchise's soul, sure, but it still looked like FNAF. Security Breach did not. But it's not enough to declare that the series was changed in 2016. The question needs to be asked, why? And it comes down to two words this time, brand image. 
2016 was a very eventful year for Five Nights at Freddy's. If you're a casual fan, this statement may seem confusing. October brought with it the only mainline game released that year. However, behind the scenes is where everything was happening. In one of the most important decisions that changed the future of FNAF, Scott Cawthon began working with Stryker Entertainment. Stryker Entertainment is a marketing agency specializing in entertainment marketing. They worked with The Walking Dead, The Hunger Games, and of course, Five Nights at Freddy's. According to Stryker, they aim to help your property realize maximum brand and financial value. They help market your brand, they license merchandise, and more. Prior to the partnership with Stryker in 2015, Five Nights at Freddy's wasn't trying to build some global initiative. To lay out the timeline of events, Scott Cawthon began working with Stryker Entertainment in October of 2015. Almost immediately afterwards, Funko announced they were working with Five Nights at Freddy's. Soon after that, McFarlane announced they would be producing building sets based on Five Nights at Freddy's. In June of that year, Scholastic announced that they were producing young adult novels in a deal facilitated by Stryker Entertainment. Every Five Nights at Freddy's product or experience was most likely brought into existence with the help of Stryker Entertainment, and it all started around this time. Now, in no way am I saying that Stryker Entertainment is some evil company that told Scott to make the series for babies, nor are they responsible for changing the series at all. However, Scott's partnership with them marks the beginning of a total brand image revision for Five Nights at Freddy's. I wouldn't necessarily say that Scott Cawthon tried to push FNAF to younger audiences, I just prefer the word wider. That's generally the cause of this franchise shift. Five Nights at Freddy's is intended for a wide audience. However, specific facets like the novels are intended for young adult audiences, as stated by Scott himself. Shifting focus from decaying bodies to mad scientists and remnant, brand association is important, and Scott wants people to think of the characters rather than what's inside of them. And that's okay. Our final question of the day is, was this metamorphosis necessary? And the answer is yes. You forget that around the release of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, the series began to fall out of favor with general audiences. PewDiePie in particular was completely unfazed during his playthrough, criticizing the predictability of the franchise. And he was right. By the sixth game, the franchise had been milked dry. It had played all its cards. The saving grace of FNAF 6 was the surprise release, the fact that it was free and its well-written ending. The Pizzeria Simulator segments are half-baked, and the night gameplay, while my personal second favorite in the franchise, isn't too pretty to look at. But the fact that it was this grand conclusion that came out of nowhere, an event for Five Nights at Freddy's fans to experience, is what elevated it to the point that it felt like an actual earned send-off. If Scott had continued, well, I think the magic would have felt lost. A massive overhaul was necessary, and the pieces had already been put in place under our noses. That big external switch to finalize that change was Security Breach. FNAF 6 was the end to the story. Ultimate Custom Night was the final challenge. Help Wanted was a nostalgic look back at what made the series great, and Security Breach was the true beginning of a new era. In the beginning of this video, I explained how Security Breach was different. It's less focused on making its characters monsters, it has an entirely different style of presentation, it's not scary, etc. But none of that is necessarily bad, it's just different. Security Breach is an objectively flawed game, that cannot be understated, and I think that was probably the biggest problem with the switch to Modern Freddy's, a road bump on an otherwise smooth path. But the actual state of the franchise itself is not as dead as people say it is. It's just different. And just like the original series, there are so many things to enjoy about it. It wants you to love its characters, not fear them. You come to love them in a way that you never could in the original series. It wants you to feel like you're an active participant not just in some spooky stories that happen at Freddy's, but in an adventure that's actively going on. It's full of larger-than-life characters and places that couldn't have existed in the slightly more grounded classic era. It understands our relationship with the series and chooses not to fight it, celebrating the legacy of the series and allowing us to celebrate with it. It takes the characters to places as we couldn't have previously imagined, not afraid to shock us with moments that defy all logic and expectations. And the original saga isn't some infallible Odyssey-level fiction. It's riddled with flaws. Predictability, lack of clear stakes, a narrative that only makes sense at the very end, and night segments that seem to just get worse every game. I made this video not just to document the changes between the original saga and the modern age, not just to explain why so many people feel the modern era is worse than the classic era, not just to talk about why this change happened, but to to explain why I am willing to step back into the series. I've accepted the change. I've accepted that it's not the same FNAF as before. I've accepted that the future of FNAF is most likely going to continue to challenge my expectations, and I'm choosing to embrace it. Help Wanted 2 was the first time since Five Nights at Freddy's 6 that I truly, deeply enjoyed a FNAF game. 
and I'm excited for what comes next. To summarize my point, the FNAF series didn't get completely changed by the release of Security Breach. All of the underlying elements that make up the series had already been in place prior, with the game's massive visual and presentational overhauls being the external change that was needed to make fans realize things were different. But it's not this is good and this is bad, it's I signed up for this and I'm suddenly being served this. Both have flaws, but both are well loved by large sections of the community. Well, that was the video for this week. I told you last week I wanted to do weekly uploads, and here we are. Uh, I personally was going to include this in the video, actually, but there's been this teasing that there's going to be, like, a Fall Fest game, which I need you to know, my number one aesthetic in, in terms of, of media is, like, spooky autumn, you know? I love that autumn feel, like, I want it to look like like Charlie Brown's Halloween, okay? You need to understand me. Maybe I'm making no sense, but I'm excited for Fall Fest, okay? If that is the next game, that sounds like it's gonna be super awesome. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, and I definitely am making more theories. This wasn't really a FNAF theory, this was a discussion about the series, but if you're looking at me like, what, where's the theory, spooky dude? That's coming. I bought all the books, I bought all 15 of the books, I bought all the tales, I bought all the frights, they're in my house, and I'm going to read all of them. And I'm going to do a video on that pretty soon. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed, feel free to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, I don't have enough Twitter subscribers, guys, or Twitter followers, I need more. Uh, if you didn't enjoy, get out. My name is Spooky Dude, and thank you for watching.